Ms. Hurd's counsel has mischaracterized the record multiple times, and Ms. Hurd lied to you. They've mischaracterized the testimony of police officers Signs and Haddon, mm -hmm. who explicitly testified that they saw no signs of injury and no property damage. They mischaracterized the testimony of Walter Hamada, who testified clearly that there was no impact on Ms. Hurd's career at Aquaman 2 from anything said by Adam Waldman or Johnny Depp. And Ms. Hurd's casting was delayed because of creative issues. They've mischaracterized the testimony of Detective Sadaga. They mischaracterized the testimony of Ronald Shell. You've been here. You've listened to the testimony. You know the record. Ms. Hurd lied. And she lied again, and she kept lying. She lied six years ago on May 27, 2016, when she walked into court in Los Angeles to publicly accuse Mr. Depp of abuse for the first time. She lied again when she told the world over and over again that she donated all of the $7 million divorce settlement to charity. You heard the evidence that, about what she donated, and you watched her. You watched her try to save her lie about that broken promise with more lies on this stand in this courtroom. She lied again when she told the world in her op-ed on December 18, 2018, that she was a public figure representing domestic abuse, painting herself as a representative of abuse survivors everywhere, and painting Mr. Depp as a representative of perpetrators. She's come too far. She can't back down. She's lied too many times to too many people. So when Mr. Depp finally decided to fight to clear his name by filing this lawsuit, Ms. Hurd responded by making up more and more stories of more and more extreme abuse. She came up with a new accusation that Mr. Depp had raped her with a bottle in Australia. And she keeps making new claims up even now. At this trial, for the very first time, she claimed that she had been sexually assaulted the night of her 30th birthday, even though she had testified repeatedly about her birthday prior and never mentioned it. And at this trial, she also claimed for the very first time that Mr. Depp was hitting her all the time during the first year of their relationship, even though this first year she had testified previously was magic and bliss with absolutely no violence. Her story is a constantly moving target. It never stays the same. Mr. Depp owns his mistake. He owns all of them. You saw him do it on the stand in a raw and powerful way. But in this trial, Ms. Hurd has been confronted with her lies and the damage she has caused. And she cannot take any responsibility for what she has done. And you've seen the story, her story, it doesn't hold up. You've watched her performance on the stand you saw her get caught in lie after lie. The time has come for those lies to come to an end. The time has come for you, the jury, to decide the truth. I started this trial giving you an opening statement and I said to you that words matter. And this case is about Ms. Hurd's words, the words she published in an op-ed about Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd and her attorneys have talked a lot about this in this trial about the First Amendment. They've talked about the importance of free speech, and we agree, and a lawyer, of course I agree with that. But the First Amendment doesn't protect lies that hurt and defame people, and there's a difference. Ms. Hurd has no right to tell the world that Mr. Depp physically or sexually assaulted her when that isn't true. That's not protected speech. Our US Constitution doesn't protect that speech. And it is a core value of American society that you are innocent until proven guilty. There, there is a presumption of innocence in this country. A person's life cannot and should not be destroyed by a baseless charge and no opportunity to defend yourself. That's why Mr. Depp had to bring this claim. Ms. Hurd was never going to stop calling him an abuser. The only way to clear his name was to stand up in this court where both sides are bound by the same rules of American law, a jury would be tasked, you, ladies and gentlemen, would be tasked with deciding once and for all, 
Ms. Hurd's lies could be exposed in a fair and impartial process. When Mr. Depp sued her, Ms. Hurd apparently decided she needed to sue him back. And because there were no statements made by Mr. Depp on which she could base the claim, she sued him based on statements made by one of his lawyers, Adam Waldman, calling Ms. Hurd's accusations of abuse a hoax. Make no mistake though, they are a hoax. Ms. Hurd made up claims of abuse, and then she gave a performance where she passionately repeated those made up claims of abuse on the stand in front of each of you. But ask yourselves, who's really the one alleging a hoax here? Who wants you to believe that everyone else is lying, committing perjury? Ms. Hurd needs you to believe that all the people who showed up in this courtroom to testify on behalf of Mr. Depp, they're all lying. She needs you to believe that the witnesses you heard from, including security professionals, former cops, medical professionals, and police officers, they're all lying. Covering up for Mr. Depp, she's asking you to believe that she's the one telling the truth and that the rest of the people in Mr. Depp's life are all part of a conspiracy of silence. This case is not just about whether you believe Mr. Depp or you believe Ms. Hurd. This case is about whether you believe Ms. Hurd or whether you believe Mr. Depp, Chrissy Dombrowski, who, yes, is here supporting her brother. Isaac Baruch, who weeped in front of the world. Kenan Wyatt, who doesn't work for Mr. Depp. Sean Betts, a former LA Sheriff's Department. Malcolm Connolly, he worked in the prisons in the UK. Starling Jenkins, a former US Marine. Travis McGivern, also another former police officer. Ben King, he worked for the Queen of England. David Kipper, Dr. David Kipper. Ms. Hurd's doctor. And yes, Mr. Depp's doctor. Debbie Lloyd, a nurse. Aaron Filotti, Ms. Hurd's personal nurse. Officer Signs, an LA police officer with training in domestic violence. Officer Haddon, her understudy, yes, in his first week studying to, to pick up on these signs of domestic abuse. Officer Gatlin, Brandon Patterson, who worked at Eastern Columbia Building, Kate James, Ms. Hurd's former personal assistant, Tara Roberts, Alejandro Romero. He took his deposition from his car because he had to go to work, but it didn't stop him from telling the truth. Edward White, Mr. Depp's business manager, Laura Wasser, one of the most famous divorce lawyers in California. Morgan Knight, Beverly Leonard, Morgan Tremaine, and Kate Moss. And all the other witnesses whose stories support Mr. Depp's description of what took place. These people have nothing to gain by coming forward. They have everything to lose. You have seen Mr. Waldman's statements and evidence in this case. When you look at them, you can tell that the key point Mr. Waldman was making in each of these statements was simply that Ms. Hurd's accusations against Mr. Depp were lies. That's why he talks about an abuse hoax. Now, Ms. Hurd has the burden of proof of proving that Mr. Waldman's statements are false. And that means that Ms. Hurd has to do more than prove that Mr. Waldman got some details wrong. She has to prove that Mr. Waldman's statements are false in their essential meaning. In other words, she has to prove that her abuse claims are not a hoax. But as we've seen, the evidence is overwhelming that Ms. Hurd's claims of abuse are false. We should also spend a bit of time talking about actual malice. It is Ms. Hurd's burden to prove that Mr. Waldman's statements were made with actual malice. And actual malice means knowledge that the statements were false or reckless, and that's an important word, reckless disregard for the truth. But here, there is clear evidence that Mr. Waldman genuinely believed that Ms. Hurd had committed a hoax. You watched him give the testimony by deposition in this case. He testified about the evidence he found persuasive the numerous witnesses and the sworn depositions of the police officers 
who went to the penthouses that night and again saw no injuries. There is no evidence in this record, none, that Mr. Waldman acted with actual malice. He believed Mr. Depp. He believed the record. It's also important to understand that because Mr. Waldman's statements were not made by Mr. Depp, Ms. Hurd needs to prove that Mr. Waldman was acting as Mr. Depp's agent. And within the scope of that agency, within the scope of the agency of the employment, when he made the statements, Mr. Waldman is a lawyer. Ms. Hurd has not presented evidence that making those statements was part of Mr. Waldman's responsibilities as Mr. Depp's lawyer. There's nothing in the record. Ms. Hurd is also claiming to be suffering from PTSD and claims that she has something to do with Mr. Waldman's statements. Ms. Hurd wants you to believe that she suffers from PTSD because Mr. Depp purportedly abused her. But as usual, Ms. Hurd is not telling the truth. As you heard from Dr. Shannon Curry, Ms. Hurd does not have PTSD and she does not act like a person with PTSD. Ms. Hurd is an actress in a major film, involved in sommelier training. She just had a baby. Dr. Curry also found that Ms. Hurd attempted to grossly exaggerate her symptoms during testing, which is a sign of malingering, or said differently, of Ms. Hurd lying. Ms. Hurd hired Dr. Don Hughes to help her with this narrative. Dr. Wait, what? Hughes PTSD. Ms. Hurd does not have PTSD, and she does not act like a person with PTSD. Ms. Hurd is an actress in a major film, involved in sommelier training. She just had a baby. Dr. Curry also found that Ms. Hurd attempted to grossly exaggerate her symptoms during testing, which is a sign of malingering, or said differently, of Ms. Hurd lying. <laughs> lingering screen test. She wasn't going to find it. One that is meant to identify an examinee's attempt to fake a severe mental illness or psychosis not PTSD. Dr. Hughes diagnosed Ms. Hurd with PTSD without administering the gold standard diagnostic test used for PTSD. She diagnosed her, think about that, she diagnosed her with PTSD before administering the test she admitted was the gold standard. Two years after diagnosing Ms. Hurd with PTSD, and shortly, curiously, shortly after Dr. Curry administered the gold standard diagnostic test, in her evaluation of Ms. Hurd, but before it was disclosed, Dr. Hughes decided to administer the gold standard, finally. Nevertheless, even after Dr. Hughes used the proper test, there were a number of deficiencies in her administration of that test. You saw them, including her failure to even follow the instructions that render her diagnoses unreliable. Ms. Hurd's claim for monetary damages related to Mr. Waldman's statements, frankly, it's a, it's a fantasy. Ms. Hurd speculates wildly that she has somehow been damaged by Mr. Waldman's statements. But in reality, Ms. Hurd has not shown any damage at all that was because of or by Mr. Waldman's statements. There is an evidence, there is evidence of a mountain of negative press coverage about Ms. Hurd including press reports about her defecating Mr. Depp's bed, <laughs> cutting off his finger, and putting out a cigarette on his face. But none of that has anything to do with Mr. Waldman's statements. And Ms. Hurd has presented no evidence, none, of any film or other project that she has lost, lost, because of the statements. In fact, you heard from Warner Brothers president, Walter Hamada, who explained that Ms. Hurd suffered no loss, none. No loss of compensation or other adverse effect on her major film, Aquaman 2. You heard it straight from him. Ms. Hurd's expert, Katherine Arnold, testified, but for the statements from Mr. Waldman, Ms. Hurd would be a much more successful in her career. To form this opinion, Ms. Arnold compares Ms. Hurd to actors such as Jason Momoa, the actual Aquaman, Chris Pine, Gal Gadot, and Zendaya. But as Richard Marks, who does deals every day, that's his job, not testifying here for a paycheck, does deals in Hollywood. 
and Doug Banya both testified that these actors are simply not comparable to Ms. Hurd. After all, Jason Momoa, he was Aquaman. Chris Pine, he was Captain Kirk. Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman. Zendaya, she's been acting since she was 13 years old on the Disney Channel. And she's in every single Spider-Man movie. Further, the Q scores of these actors are not at all comparable with Ms. Hurd's Q scores. As Mr. Banya testified, Ms. Hurd's rating was less compared to these actors and all of Ms. Hurd's Q scores ratings were less favorable than the average of all performers. As you heard from Michael Spindler, because Ms. Arnold relies on the salaries of these comparable actors to calculate Ms. Hurd's damages, Ms. Hurd's claim for damages makes no sense. There's no connection. Further and more fatally for Ms. Hurd's damages claim is that there's no connection to the Waldman statements, to Mr. Waldman's statements. Even if you find damage to her career, you have to connect it to the defamatory statements. There is no connection. Mr. Banya testified that all the negative tweets that Ms. Hurd has entered into evidence have no causal connection to the statements underlying Ms. Hurd's counterclaims. Specifically, Ms. Hurd's expert, Mr. Ron Shell, presented a flawed methodology that included picking out hashtags at random, including justice for Johnny Depp. What does that have to do with the Waldman statements? And counting accompanying tweets, even though it had nothing to do with Mr. Waldman. Ms. Hurd's counterclaim is based on statements by Mr. Waldman, not Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd knows perfectly well that she hasn't suffered any damages from those statements. Buried at the bottom of articles in a mere tabloid, the Daily Mail. And the statements are substantially true since they all, since all they do really is point out that Ms. Hurd's abuse allegations are false. Ms. Hurd's counsel argued that Ms. Hurd did not write the title of the online version of the op-ed, which stated, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. It does not matter whether or not Ms. Hurd wrote the title. You will recall from the court's instructions this morning that what matters is whether Ms. Hurd republished the defamatory language. That instruction states in part that you should find Ms. Hurd republished this article if she, quote, retransmitted the defamatory material with the goal of achieving a new audience. Stated differently, republication occurs when the speaker has affirmatively, that's important, affirmatively reiterated the statement. Ms. Hurd affirmatively reiterated the statement. She posted it on her Twitter. If we could please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 3. This is the tweet Ms. Hurd sent. She retweeted the Washington Post tweet to a new audience, her own Twitter followers. And she affirmatively reiterated the statement by proudly declaring, today I published this op-ed in the Washington Post. She didn't quibble with the title. She said proudly, today I published this op-ed in the Washington Post. The title of the op-ed was prominently displayed in the tweet. That is enough for you, members of the jury, to find that Ms. Hurd republished the title of the op-ed and adopted the statement as her own. She can and should be held liable and responsible for that statement. Ms. Hurd tries to make something out of the fact that Mr. Waldman reported her to law enforcement in Los Angeles for perjury after her allegations of abuse were made against Mr. Depp. But I'll submit to you that all this proves is that Mr. Waldman believes Ms. Hurd has committed perjury. Mr. Ronborn argued that the lack of supporting evidence for Ms. Hurd's allegations of horrendous, constant abuse is somehow not something to be considered. That it is shameful for you to consider the fact that she didn't document all the terrible injuries that she claims to have suffered. That is a twisted argument. First, you know, because you have seen and listened to Ms. Hurd in action, that Ms. Hurd is a woman who's documenting things throughout the relationship. And it is instructive that the things she chose to document had nothing to do with violence. 
She documented Mr. Depp sleeping. She documented lines of cocaine featuring prominently Mr. Depp's loan out company or um, production company, Infinitum. Stage photographs, that's what she documented. Mr. Rottenborn's entire argument assumes that Mr. Depp, a man, should be disbelieved because despite the fact that Ms. Heard can't support her accusations with actual evidence. What we have put to you, the jury, is not that because Ms. Heard didn't take enough pictures or tell people about abuse that it didn't happen. What we have put to you is that given how brutal and constant the abuse Ms. Heard claims, she would have had serious injuries. That's a fact. She would have had serious injuries that would have been observable in the pictures we looked at and by the witnesses we heard from and would have required medical attention. That's it. Ms. Heard testifies to injuries that multiple people didn't see. What you have in the end is Ms. Heard's word. Do you trust it? We are not here because Ms. Heard told the world Mr. Depp was verbally abusive. This is not about the words used by Mr. Depp. We are here because Ms. Heard told the world that Mr. Depp was physically and sexually abusive. That's what Ms. Heard was saying in the op-ed. On May 27th, exactly six years ago today, 2016, Ms. Heard walked into court with a mark on her face to tell the world that her husband was abusive. She renewed that falsehood in her op-ed, describing herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. And she published the op-ed, including the title, claiming that she spoke up against sexual violence. Everyone, everyone knew who she was talking about when she used those words. She was alleging physical and sexual abuse. She was not alleging emotional or psychological abuse. She was alleging physical and sexual abuse. Ms. Heard cannot run away from her own allegations now. You have all heard the evidence of what she alleged against Mr. Depp in 2016. And you have all heard her incredibly dramatic, over-the-top story of physical and sexual abuse. That story was a defamatory lie. Ms. Heard tried to argue that you only need to find that Mr. Depp might have touched Ms. Heard once in order to find in her favor, because that makes her a victim of abuse. But common sense should tell you that you can't pick and choose Ms. Heard's allegations. You saw her on the stand. We all did. She gave the performance of her life, telling you story after story of abuse. And not just any abuse, but extravagant, over-the-top allegations of abuse that would be truly brutal, horrific, if true. You either believe all of it, or you believe none of it. Either she's telling the truth, including in her most extreme allegations, or she's lying. Either she was raped by a bottle, or she's the sort of person who would get on the stand in this courtroom and lie to you and the world about being raped. And if she would lie about that, what wouldn't she lie about? You can't find that Mr. Depp hit her once. Either he hit her countless times, or you can't believe a single word that comes out of her mouth. And what is the actual meaning of Ms. Heard's op-ed? That's an important question. It's not that Mr. Depp said a nasty word to her once. It's not that Mr. Depp might have hit her once. It's that she is a representative of domestic abuse. And by extension, Mr. Depp is a representative of abuse perpetrators. Words matter. Ms. Heard has shown you a lot of text messages from Mr. Depp with some very vivid language. As I told you at the start of this trial, Mr. Depp has a unique style of writing. He uses words I don't use. And you probably don't use either. But as you also heard during this trial, Mr. Depp writes in that way in part because he modeled his writings on literary giants like Hunter S. Thompson. And he's got a dark sense of humor. It's not everyone's cup of tea. 
but it's who he is. And Mr. Depp owns text messages. He acknowledges that he said those things, and he said things that he shouldn't have. But using bad language and colorful humor does not mean that you are a violent abuser. And ironically, as much as Ms. Hurd is trying to use Mr. Depp's words against him, it is Ms. Hurd who repeatedly admitted to violence. In her own words, you've heard the tapes. You've heard her admit to violence. Ms. Hurd can try to distract you with text messages showing that Mr. Depp uses bad language and has a dark sense of humor. But none of that, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, none of that is evidence of abuse. Hitting your husband is evidence of abuse. Mr. Ronborn talked about the burden of proof. Let's talk about that for a minute. Mr. Depp only has to show that it is more likely than not, more likely than not, that the statements in the op-ed are false, that it is more likely than not that they have a defamatory implication that it is more likely than not that Ms. Hurd designed and intended the statements to refer to Mr. Depp. And the evidence on, this, on these points is clear. Ms. Hurd made these allegations six years ago today, May 27th, 2016. She went out of her way to make them public, tipping off TMZ. When she published the op-ed, she was reminding everyone in Hollywood and the world of her abuse claims. And those claims are a lie. Consider what the true purpose of the article. Mr. Ronborn said it was to promote legislative reforms. But what was it actually? The evidence shows it was to promote Ms. Heard. It was time to be released at the same time as Aquaman on December 21st, 2018. And it was time to coincide with her announcement of her ambassadorship at the ACLU for women's rights. That's not a coincidence. It was designed that way. That was not a statement about legislative reforms. This was about burnishing Ms. Hurd's reputation at the expense of Mr. Depp's. It was about Ms. Hurd continuing to portray herself as a heroic survivor of abuse. And on the question of actual malice, that just means whether or not Ms. Hurd knew the allegations were false. Ms. Hurd knows perfectly well that she wasn't abused. She has direct knowledge of that. She was in that relationship. So actual malice is easily established. You may have noticed that no one showed up for Ms. Hurd in this courtroom other than her sister. Every other witness who traveled to Virginia for her was a paid expert. This is a woman who burns bridges. Her close friends don't show up for her. Mr. Rottenborn tried to discredit Mr. Depp's witnesses by suggesting they're all on Mr. Depp's payroll. So he doubled down on the hoax theory that everyone's just lying. First of all, it's not even true Keenan Wyatt isn't, is on his payroll. Ben King isn't on his payroll. Melissa Sign, Officer Melissa Sines isn't on his payroll. Morgan Tremaine isn't on his payroll. Officer Tyler Haddon, he's not on his payroll. Beverly Leonard, Alejandro Romero, Brandon Patterson, Morgan Knight, none of those people are on his payroll. And Kate Moss, Kate Moss is most definitely not on Mr. Depp's payroll. Ms. Hurd wants you to believe that all these people are lying. Let's talk about the Boston plane. Ms. Hurd wants you to believe that the recording you heard is from the Boston plane flight, but that's quite telling. What did Ms. Hurd capture of this supposed rampage? Mr. Depp moaning in distress? That's what she chose to record. What sort of person records something like that? What sort of person takes pictures of their husband or boyfriend or fiance who's struggling with sobriety, nodding off with ice cream dripping down his leg, his hand in his pocket, or asleep on the ground. What sort of person does that? Definitely not someone that's afraid of him. And Ms. Hurd's attorney told a story of May 21 
that was completely, utterly inconsistent with the testimonies of Officer Sines and Haddon, who testified clearly that they saw no signs of injury, no sign of property damage. And she told a story about how Officer Sadag Sadanaga, I'll get that right, Sadanaga's testimony was also wrong. She testified that the report was only required in case of a crime. Ms. Hurd's attorneys tried to tell you that Mr. Depp apologized on May 22nd because he had hit Ms. Hurd. Mr. Depp didn't apologize to Ms. Hurd on May 22nd for hitting her. He apologized because he was leaving Ms. Hurd. And this was a woman that in spite of all her violence and all her rage, Mr. Depp, he loved her. He had been with her for years. Of course he apologized when he finally broke it off. Ms. Bredehoff also tried to tell you that Ms. Hurd did everything in her power to keep the authorities away and to not get Mr. Depp in trouble on May 21st, 2016. Take a minute and think back to what Ms. Hurd did six days later, six years ago today. She walked into court with a visible mark on her face, not wearing makeup that day. She tipped off TMZ, she made it public, and she showed up on the cover of People magazine with a mark on her face. Was that protecting Mr. Depp? Or was she trying to destroy him? Mr. Rottenborn asked you to consider why you're here. So why are you here? You're here because of a lie. And that was a lie that Ms. Heard repeated in the op-ed. At the start of this trial, we told you that this trial is about the evidence. The evidence overwhelmingly shows that Ms. Heard is an abuser and that she is a liar. She lied about Mr. Depp and took on the role of a lifetime as a public figure representing domestic abuse. What is her best evidence of that abuse? A video of Mr. Depp banging cabinets around and text messages of Mr. Depp using bad words and dark, ugly humor, but never once admitting to abuse. Pictures of Mr. Depp sleeping. That's her best evidence. Ms. Heard herself, Ms. Heard held herself out to the world as a representative of abuse survivors everywhere, the face of the Me Too movement. This is not a Me Too situation. There are no Me Too's. Just not knees. Ms. Heard does not deserve to be known as a representative of survivors of abuse. And Mr. Depp does not deserve to be known as a representative of perpetrators of abuse. That is what this case is about. It's not about money. It's about giving Mr. Depp his life back six years ago when she took it away. While you deliberate, ask yourselves why Mr. Depp would put himself through this. Expose every embarrassing detail of his life on national television. If he was guilty of anything, anything that Ms. Hurd accuses him of. We ask you, we implore you to render a verdict for Mr. Depp. We ask you to set the record straight that he is not the abuser she described and that she is not the heroic survivor she portrayed. And we ask you to tell Ms. Hurd that what she did was wrong. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, ma'am. Rebuttal closing. Surprised they're having Roddenborn do it, really. Not Elaine? Oh, it is Mommy Elaine. Grandma Elaine. How about that? Yes. yes. Thank you. No? Roddenborn. Really? <laughs> oh, man, I feel like he lacks emotional connection, but okay. He need Needlehoff to do it. <laughs> okay. Rod and board it is. Ladies and gentlemen, it's interesting that in both their opening and their rebuttal closing that you heard Mr. Depp's attorneys address none of Ms. Heard's witnesses. 
None of Ms. Hurd's witnesses. They listed their own who didn't see, who, who were on his payroll, weren't there behind closed doors with him, but they didn't address any of the witnesses. For example, Josh Drew, Rocky Pennington, Liz Mars, who were all there on May 21st, Melanie Iglesias, who covered Ms. Hurd's bruises. They say that no one showed up for her. No one showed up for her, but then they say that these people aren't friends anymore. If they're not friends anymore, then why would they be doing what they would suggest are lying for her? Why would they be corroborating everything that she says? If the, it's this simple. If you believe that Depp was abusive to Amber one time ever, in any of the various forms of abuse, not only physical, verbal, emotional, psychological, sexual, any of the ways of abuse, then your job is very easy. And you can not only deny Mr. Depp's claim, but you can find for Amber on her counterclaim. And it's interesting that Ms. Vasquez just changed their theory after six weeks. She said, oh, well, domestic abuse just means physical abuse. It's not what Mr. Depp said. It's not what Dr. Curry said. It's not what Dr. Hughes said. It's not what you know to be true. You know that the evidence that you've seen constitutes all sorts of abuse. And there's a reason that they're running as fast as they can from those sorts of abuse because they know that he did it. Now the suggestion that Amber's abuse allegations are a hoax is vicious and vile. Mr. Depp can say whatever he wants now, but he can't say change the evidence that you've seen at the trial. And the evidence shows that Ms. Heard did not commit abuse hoaxes, not about sexual violence, not about May 21st, 2016, and certainly not about Mr. Depp and Mr. Wallman's catch-all, all-purpose statement that Ms. Heard's abuse hoax which suggests that every one of her allegations are false, that that's coming to an end. The evidence shows she did not commit any of those hoaxes. The evidence shows that she was abused exactly how not only she, but her witnesses supporting her claims say that she was, and their witnesses even, who claim that Mr. Depp abused her. Ms. Vasquez talked about actual malice. She says, because Mr. Waldman was acting as Mr. Depp's agent, you have to look at Mr. Waldman. They're standing in the shoes of one another. And as Mr. Depp's agent, Mr. Depp's malice is Mr. Waldman's malice. Mr. Depp's Waldman malice is Mr. Waldman's malice. He acted with actual malice when he made these statements. Now, after years and years of Mr. Depp controlling the roles that Ms. Heard took, Ms. Heard had the biggest hit of her career, three months before she was sued. She had withstood Mr. Depp's attempt to have her fired from Aquaman and his own jealousy as his career went down the drain before her op-ed for reasons having nothing to do with Ms. Heard. But once the lawsuit against Ms. Heard was filed, his campaign that he promised to destroy her entered a new phase. And then it reached a crescendo when Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman decided to meet with the Daily Mail together and decided to plant statements that were defamatory of Ms. Heard in the spring of 2020, leading up to the UK trial. You've heard Amber and her agent, Jessica Kovacevic, talk about the impact to Amber's career. She can't get hired because of the negative treatment she gets. Studios like her, co-stars like her, she tests well, but she can't get opportunities because of the negativity associated with Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman. You heard Amber Heard on the stand yesterday telling you exactly what she has experienced as a result of Mr. Depp's promise to bring her global humiliation. That promise, to, to paraphrase Catherine Arnold, Ms. Heard's damages expert, that promise was a spark. And that promise he kept because he had told her again and again, the only way out of this is death. And when she chose a different path out of it, he decided to make that promise. He decided to throw that spark. And when Mr. Waldman became involved, that spark became a forest fire. That forest fire has continued to this day. We ask, ladies and gentlemen, that you hold Mr. Depp accountable for his actions. Stand up for victims of domestic abuse everywhere who suffer in silence. 
Stand up for the freedom of speech, the freedom to speak about your life that the First Amendment protects. Give Amber Heard her voice back. Give Amber Heard her life back. Thank you so much for your service on this jury. Thank you, Mr. Rottenborn. Members of the jury, this is an important case to both the plaintiff and the defendant.